We are live. Welcome back to Science on a Saturday. Today we're going to talk about exercise and exercise capacity and how it might be linked with reduced severeness of this illness that is circulating in many of our communities throughout the world. So uh, thanks as always for being here for Science on a Saturday. Today we're just going to unpack some studies. Now this is not some you know bro science literature. This is uh, as I get to some of the, of the slides here. And I'm doing this one handed. I actually cut my finger yesterday on a saw uh, working on <laughs> working on this sauna build out more on that a little bit later. But this is the article from the Mayo Clinic proceedings. Now what's really interesting about this article and we're going to unpack the details of this so that you can understand the science and and the point of kind of sharing this with you is number one, this this bug, this microbe, this highly transmissible microbe is circulating in our all of our communities. And we want to encourage, uh, I know you're already converted, but I will add the caveat in the sense that when I do one-on-one -on -one consulting with clients, I find a lot of clients do a little bit of walking, they're eating great food, they're compressing their feeding window, but a lot of people are not exercising exercising intensely. And so as you see here on this little uh, image here, there's, an, uh, there's a correlation, a U-shaped curve between curve between your exercise intensity and your body's immune system functioning and capacity. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And some really interesting, uh, I think this finding is, is quite interesting because they, uh, the scientists here, the researchers at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, they actually had some exercise capacity data in individuals that either went had a cardiac stress test for a, a myriad of different reasons. Maybe it was a pre-op, a surgical, uh, you know, sometimes this is done before surgery. This is done when people have chest pain and so forth. So there was, I think, uh, how many different, let me kind of dive into the details, 1,200 different subjects here. About 20% of them also had uh, coronavirus. They were also positive for SARS-CoV-2. So it was kind of an interesting data set in that the scientists could figure out if there was a correlation between poor outcomes, risk of hospitalization, uh, and disease severity when it comes to this virus. And there was a statistically significant and independently, after adjusting for other factors, a direct correlation between low exercise capacity as performed with a standardized cardiovascular stress test, an exercise stress test, and poor outcomes. And so again, exercise is not this sort of optional thing that, well, maybe when I have the time in two or three months or next year that I'm going to start exercising, you need to start exercising now, irrespective of what other health things you have going on. Exercise is essential. So it's essential that we, uh, you know, obviously keep physical fitness uh, facilities and gyms and fitness studios open going forward. But it's also important that we understand that exercise is essential for the immune system. And exercise and the ability to undergo a high capacity of exercise, for example, the image on this thumbnail is Cynthia Monteleone, a past podcast guest and friend, who is a big advocate for sprinting for people over the age of 40, for women, for even elder, she has elderly clients, uh, people of all shapes, colors, ages, sizes, and exercise levels. And I actually did a sprint workout with her when I was visiting Hawaii in November. And there was people who had never done, you know, sprinting before uh, in that course. Uh, you know, it was outside on the beach, barefoot. It was amazing. So the ability to perform high intensity exercise and tolerate that is is a, a is a proxy of resilience. So when you are insulted with, say, uh, influenza, the flu, a common cold, or a, a benign respiratory virus, or even SARS-CoV-2, you have the ability to still oxygenate your tissues and get oxygen because you have more bandwidth. So that's where we're going. That's what we're talking about, friends. Uh, as always, thanks for being here. Let's dive into some of the different studies. So uh, first of all, uh, as many of you know, throughout the week, I like to read articles and then share them with you on on this podcast. And so, so this was a really good one that I found that um, helps kind of, you know, people that are not really convinced that their exercise and their lifestyle change matters. And so the title of this is Coronavirus Disease 2019. Um, and, and this article, this, this David uh, Newman goes on to talk about how all of our chronic uh, ailments from obesity to diabetes to hypertension, cardiovascular disease are exacerbating and, and leading us to be more susceptible to uh, immunologic challenges. So I thought that was a great, great study just to dive into. Um, now, before we get going, friends, I know that it's hard for sometimes your friends and family to change their diet, right? There's a lot of people that love their ice cream or their treats or their different cookies or uh, baked goods and things like that. And I want to give you access to a recipe ebook with over 37 amazing low-carb ketogenic recipes, including a very low-carb and very tasty raw cookie dough recipe that's phenomenal. 
different cakes and 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 so forth uh even really healthy uh he- well as as healthy as a donut can be with this recipe ebook so if you go over to our website myoscience.com and you use the coupon code ebook12 you get access to this ebook that's uh, i believe 19 different pages so if you've been kind of wondering you know hey should i get some vitamin d what if i need some liquid iodine what about some probiotics what about uh my relax and calm that's part electrolyte part blood sugar health support part sleep enhancement you can go over to myoscience with an x.com that's myoscience.com and use the coupon code ebook to save on this ebook bundle so uh, any order over 39 dollars, you automatically get access to this so it's a phenomenal ebook as part of one of our low carb keto uh, e-classes so uh, if you're interested in learning some cool recipes that your whole family will enjoy i would suggest checking that out Okay, so let's dive into the study. I think it's important to understand the parameters of the study, understand the details of this, and maybe this might be the the motivation, uh, the scientific validation for you to start exercising. Because I know a lot of us are, you know, it, we come from varying levels of fitness backgrounds. Some people are collegiate athletes, you know, in the past. Some people haven't sprinted or, or done any exercise for any period of time. So let's kind of talk about this. So what these scientists did, uh, as I mentioned kind of earlier at the start of this, but just kind of drill down on the details so that you understand this, because I know you coach, cl- a lot of you coach clients where you're practitioners. So there was uh, over, a th- I think it was 2,100 some odd uh, subjects that were identified that met the inclusion criteria in that it, they were you know patients or um, they had medical records at this Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. Again, this is published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, and they also had a cardiovascular stress test. So they were able to ascertain both cardiovascular stress tests, and also they had uh, SARS-CoV-2 testing, either positive or negative. And so they looked at the positive cases. I think there was 200 and some odd positive cases of people who also had a cardiovascular stress test. And so here's kind of the summary of this, and, and you're seeing this here. These are peak MET, um, metabolic exercise test equivalents, I, I believe. And so this is a standardized way to kind of look at exercise capacity. So they broke this down into quartiles so that it could be evaluated. And people with the lowest ability to perform high-intensity exercise had the highest likelihood of being hospitalized. So again, it's kind of interesting because... Don't you remember the media for the last 12 months saying everyone is equally susceptible and equally equally likely to end up in the hospital and on a on, in the ICU and on a ventilator? But actually, this study shows that for people that had the highest exercise capacity, the they had the lowest probability of being hospitalized. So let's just kind of dive into this. Uh, and unpack some of the findings. And what I'll do here is leave this leave this article uh, right here. Okay, so respiratory viral infections like severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, cause a systemic inflammatory response that places a substantial burden on the cardiopulmonary system. So again, we have a stressor to the cardiopulmonary system. And so the more aerobically fit you are, and the more the more tolerant you are of high intensity exercise, the more buffer or bandwidth you'll be able to tolerate when you are stressed. And so this is the connection here. So higher cardiorespiratory fitness is reflective of a greater cardiopulmonary reserve. So they're saying it in words way more eloquent than I ever can. Uh, and of the body's ability to respond to an insult, as well as inversely related to risk for adverse outcomes among individuals diagnosed with a chronic disease. Fitness is moderated by you know genetics, uh, genomics, and things like that. Um, so I'm going to skip over this sort of thing. But there are some notes here that I do want to understand the shortcomings and the limitations in the interpretation of uh, the study because I think it's interesting. The purpose of this retrospective study, so it's important to understand that they're using data that they had already collected and adding in some of the new data with regards to coronavirus positivity and uh, relating that to the statistical probability of being hospitalized. The purpose of this retrospective study was to investigate the relationship between maximal exercise capacity measured during a clinically uh, indicated exercise stress test performed before SARS-CoV-2 infection and hospitalization due to COVID-19. We hypothesized that maximal exercise capacity would be independently and inversely related to hospitalization. So they had, that was our hypothesis leading into uh, the actual study. So let's, let's go on here. I have some notes here. Okay. Here's some of the details uh, of this. 
All right, so I'm, remember, I'm doing this with one hand because I damn near chopped the tip of my finger off yesterday with the saw building the sauna. Okay, here we go. Uh, we identified 1,181 patients who had an exercise stress test and a test for SARS-CoV-2 uh, and complete data to include in the analysis. And so that's what you're seeing here. So this is the, the actual analysis uh, that goes to show sort of what happened and the correlation between exercise capacity and probability of being hospitalized. Okay, so let's go on to some of the findings here. I think this is this is really interesting. So I'm just reading to everyone, uh, if you're wondering what these papers are going on. Characteristics of the 246 patients who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 are shown in table one, which is what you're seeing right, uh, right here. Among these patients, 89, which is 36% of, of the total group of 1,100 uh, some odd patients were hospitalized. Um, okay, compared to those who were not hospitalized for COVID-19, patients who were hospitalized were significantly older and more likely to have hypertension, diabetes mellitus, coronary heart disease, chronic kidney disease, and heart failure. Okay, we've talked about this before. Chronic conditions make you more susceptible to severe viral infections. This is not, not new. Hospitalized patients were also more likely to be prescribed an anti-epileptic uh, medication, calcium channel blocker, beta blocker, diuretic, insulin, uh, antiplatelet, so blood thinning medication, and so forth. Among the hospitalized patients, median length of stay was 13 days, um, 28 patients, so 11% of the people that were positive were admitted to the intensive care unit and so forth. So you know all, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, let's get into let's get into uh, the dis the discussion here because this is where I think it gets quite interesting. In a diverse cohort of patients who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, we showed an independent and inverse association between maximal exercise capacity and likelihood of hospitalization for COVID-19. A finding consistent with our hypothesis. So again, there's an inverse relationship between your your exercise capacity and probability or likelihood of ending up being hospitalized. Now, let's talk about probability and likelihood because I think this is something that people, you know, we, we talk about these studies and we unpack these and there is no guarantees in life. You know, if you drive the speed limit and you wear your seatbelt, it's highly probable that you will not be in a fatal, you know, and you don't drink and drive, that you won't be in a fatal car accident. But, but you know, um, unfortunate things happen to good people and there, there are statistical outliers, right? And so there are healthy people who probably did everything right that just had an increased viral load or some sort of genetic predisposition that we don't yet know about that were hospitalized. But by and large, if we look at probability and statistics, that's those are the outliers, okay? So let's go on here and review some of the details of this because I, I think it's really fascinating. Uh, cardiorespiratory fitness or exercise capacity directly reflects the integrated function of multiple organ systems. So when you exercise, you increase capillary density, you increase mitochondrial function, you increase blood flow, you move lymph around. There's a lot of things. You reduce inflammation. There's so many different benefits to exercise, okay? As such, it is important to measure, it is important it is, it is an important measure of overall health and the body's ability to respond to internal and external stressors, as such COVID-19. Akin to this is the practice of measuring exercise capacity before surgery uh, to categorize individuals based upon uh, their risk, okay, and their ability to tolerate the perioperative cardiopulmonary burden associated with surgery. So I think that's interesting. So again, your body's ability to tolerate intervals and high intensity exercise is is, is, a, is linked with resilience. Um, so COVID-19 represents another burden or stressor on the cardiopulmonary system, providing a potential physiologic explanation for the observed inverse association between maximal exercise capacity and risk for hospitalization. Finally, this association is consistent with previous findings in patients referred for an exercise stress test and those with a chronic disease, including coronary artery disease, a chronic kidney disease, and heart failure. This is in addition to physiologic rationale for our findings, and it involves the first appreciation that an individual's exercise capacity is greatly influenced by physical activity and exercise training habits. That is really important. It adds to our findings, and it involves first appreciating that an individual's exercise capacity is greatly influenced by physiological activity and exercise training habits. So your ability to tolerate stress is influenced by what you do in the gym or out up, you know, on a road sprinting or on your bike or so forth. So exercise capacity is important. 
Specifically, uh, okay, let's let's dive into this. Implications for our findings are important for several reasons. First, like smoking and obesity, exercise capacity is a modifiable factor that could be a target for preventing strategies. Um, <clears throat> sorry, there's some brackets here and so forth, and the page is turning. So sorry if I, I botched that one up. Uh, let's let's we're moving on here. Uh, secondarily, exercise capacity was one of the strongest predictors of hospitalization amongst patients positive for SARS-CoV-2. So again, when the media says everyone is uniquely or equally likely, susceptibility is the same for every single person. Well, now we know obesity. We know high blood pressure. We know diabetes, prediabetes, glucose variability, glycemic variability, inflammatory status, immunosenescence, and now exercise capacity. So again, People can lie by omitting evidence, and it seems that the media has sort of omitted a lot of evidence that is now uh, being widely uh, published. Uh, okay, third, the association we identified may be an important consideration for future trials and investigate factors associated with disease-specific uh, complications. Such trials might consider exercise capacity and so forth. Okay, all, although the risk for viral infections associated with changes in fitness or changes in physical activity habits is beyond the scope of this analysis, these data reinforce several uh, important public health messages. First, both volume of physical activity and exercise capacity are inversely related to risk of infection. Let's, let's check that out one more time. First, both volume of physical activity and exercise capacity are inversely related to risk of infection. Incident chronic disease, like chronic disease, high blood pressure, cardiometabolic disease, and so forth, and health outcomes. Second, changes in both physical activity and exercise capacity is inversely associated with health outcomes. So friends, if you're not yet motivated to start exercising, to do high intensity interval training, to do sprinting, and all the details about how to start sprinting is discussed in the podcast with Cynthia Monteleone that after this is done, I will link in the show notes for you. So there's a lot of tools available for that. And then we, we must not forget that strength training is really important. So I think this is the, this is the end of, of this particular article. Um, I'll link it in the show notes. Again, this is not published in the Journal of Bro Science, you know, uh, you know, theoretical uh, research. This is published in Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Now we're going to talk about grip strength. So we know that strength is important. We know that grip strength is independently correlated with uh, mortality. Uh, the more grip strength you have, the least likely you are to die. And this is data pulled from all over the world, uh, from individuals in you know, varying uh, countries throughout the world, including the US and the UK and, and Nordic regions and Europe and all that sort of stuff. But also some new analysis show that grip strength is linked with outcomes with, guess what, the uh, novel human coronavirus. So I don't have all the details uh, of this particular study, but this is a preprint, and I think it's worth just diving into, and let me just share with you sort of um, uh, the background and perspective and, and rationale for understanding why it's important to lift weights and to get physically fit, because the data uh, is quite clear that when you are weak, that that has um, challenges and implications when it comes to how likely you are to survive if you're infected uh, with, with microbes and much more. So uh, let's dive into this. Okay, a weak muscle strength has been associated with a wide range of adverse health outcomes. Yet, whether individuals with weaker strength are more at risk for hospitalization due to severe COVID-19 is unclear. The objective of this study was to investigate the independent association between muscle strength and COVID-19 hospitalization. So data from 3,600 adults 50 years uh, of age or older were analyzed using logistic models adjusted for several chronic conditions, body mass index, age, and sex. Hand grip strength was repeatedly measured between 2004 and 2017. So remember, this is a retrospective study. So they're going back and looking at people who have both positivity data when it comes to SARS-CoV-2 infectivity and also a prior hand grip strength. Because if you're hospitalized and you're really sick and, and so forth, it'd be impractical to be like, well, hey, you, you're weaker. Your hand grip strength is weaker when you're already infected. So that's, that's where you know, it's, it's important to understand this. Okay, results. Results show that a higher grip strength was associated with a lower risk of COVID-19 hospitalization. So the, the odds of that is, so it's 64% less likely. So the more strength, the, more, the stronger your grip strength, that means you're 64% less likely to be hospitalized. Uh, I think that's pretty significant, 
probably more significant than than honestly if you look at the data on face masking in the public but anyway results are also results also show that age uh, and obesity were associated with higher risk of covid-19 hospitalizations sensitivity analysis using different measurements of grip strength was uh, as well as robust robustness analysis based on uh, rare events, logistics, regression, which I don't know anything about, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's get to the conclusion. Muscle strength is an independent risk factor for COVID-19 severity in adults 50 years of age or older. Muscle strength is an independent risk factor for COVID-19 severity, okay? Uh, when have you heard about that in the media? Remember this time last year saying that exercise is beneficial? Is it conspiracy theory? Remember how many podcasts and episodes I posted on this channel that said, open up the gyms because we knew that obesity was, a, was an issue with regards to hospitalization and disease severity. And so many of you in the comments said, gyms are germ factories, oh my God. Now we have data because in, in Florida and Texas and other, believe it or not, other states in the US kept their gyms open and did not mandate people wear face masks in there. There's very, very, very little data to show that physical fitness facilities and gyms were ever a source of major outbreaks because people going to gyms, gym goers, people that are exercising are boosting their immune system. So instead of making rash decisions and saying, gyms, close everything down, close parks. Remember when parks were closed? How idiotic that was? Anyway, friends, fitness is essential business. And, and I keep sharing this with you so that because I know as Westerners, we love data, we love information, we love science, right? Uh, here is the science. The science clearly shows that exercise and physical fitness uh, is essential business. It's, it's good for you. It's going to prevent and reduce your probability of being hospitalized and much more. So uh, before I get to your questions, I do want to remind you, if you want access to this ebook, which has over 37 amazing low-carb re recipes, keto-friendly recipes from desserts and, and uh, puddings and raw cookie dough, all using things like uh, chestnut flour and almond flour, coconut flour, uh, coconut butter, things like that, uh, amazing. All you have to do is go over to our website, myoscience.com, and Place any order over $39 so you can get some vitamin D, you can get some um, you know, multivitamins, multiminerals for your children, you can get some liquid iodine just to have around, and use the coupon code ebook12 at checkout. Ebook12, you get full access to this bonus dessert recipe ebook. So I am going to get to some of your questions right now. As always, I'm grateful that you're here live. Thanks for being here, friends. Uh, let's get into this. Okay, Globe Twig says the right type of exercise for the right person is important. 100%. Um, I think it's important, you know, the right foods for the right person are, are really important. You know, some people do really well on a, on a carnivore diet. I've met some people that don't do so well. So there's uh, personalizing this. And, and I see here, so Bunny Kisses 1000 says, I love kettlebells. I'm with you. Kettlebells are, are, are phenomenal. Um, and we have Super Tap 007 says, I do gravel bike sprints at a park nearby and kettlebells at home. I'm a 43 year old Asian meat based uh, diet person. Uh, amazing. Super Tap 007. Uh, phenomenal. So when it comes to exercise, the easiest exercises to do are the ones that you enjoy. So if you like to go to Pilates class and that's what you want to do, go to Pilates class. Just because the guru gets ripped doing kettlebells, if you don't like kettlebells, try, you know, give it, a, give it a, a good six weeks to try to learn and incorporate and create a habit out of new exercise plans. But if you don't like lifting weights and you just hate it and you'd rather be doing sprints outside on your bike or, you know, just sprinting, you know, with your own two feet, then, then do that. Do what you'll consistently enjoy and what, what, what brings you a joy in this world. Okay, so uh, Boga says, just finished an hour-long hit class, and now I'm here. Uh, it's no coincidence that you're here. Uh, things happen in life for a reason, so I'm glad that you're here, and I hope you had a great workout. Okay, I've maintained a consistent four- to seven-day-a-week workout for the last 23 years. Whew, amazing. I love that. I became a personal trainer at 51. I'm now 58. See, friends, you can learn this at any age. That is so phenomenal. I specialize in the home workout. Haven't needed a gym in a long, long time. Okay, so Bunny Kisses 1000. Um, if you have an Instagram or something like that, um, please type it in the comments after this video gets posted so people can connect with you. Scott says... Once proven that the vaccine prevents transmission, I will get it. I believe that at 50, my immune system can handle COVID because I eat and exercise properly. Scott, I'm with you. I have friends in their 50s that have gotten the virus and 
they have a they they adhere to a great nutrition program and lifestyle, and it was quite mild for them. So uh, everyone is is different and unique. So Chris says hi from the UK. I work out five days a week. I can't remember the last time I was sick. Chris, join the club. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm 100% in agreement with that. Okay, Scott says, I've been working out and lifting weights three days a week for the last six months when Washington doesn't shut down gyms. This week, I'm adding two days of high-intensity interval training and making my weekends for recovery. Scott, hats off to you. I am with you, and hello, fellow Washingtonian. Um, so I'm with you. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Joe says there are long haulers who worked out regularly and ate healthy. People who downplay the virus are part of a death cult. <laughs> uh, okay, so Joe King, let's 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 have a little reality check here. I'm not downplaying the virus. I'm saying that exercise is essential business and encouraging people to exercise more. I'm not saying go out there and lick toilet seats in the intensive care unit. I'm saying that the I'm saying what the media is not telling you. The media is not telling you that you can reduce your probability of being severely ill. This virus is going around. You can't hide in your home forever. It's unlikely that we're going to be wearing face masks for the rest of our lives So because they're bad for the environment. There's side effects to our intervention. So I'm simply trying to give people tools that they're not getting from other media outlets. So Joe King, I am not trying to, uh, to kill people. Why would I have a health channel if I'm trying to kill people? Um, sorry that, that the media outlets that you're consuming content from uh, like to kind of pin people against each other seemingly. So uh, trust me, that's not what we're doing here. Are there people who are long haulers? Yeah, there are. There are people who are long haulers from getting tick bites by being out in the woods. Does that mean you never go out hiking because you might get a tick bite and you might be, you might get Borrelia, Babesia, or a Rocky Mountain spotted fever? No, that means you, you take caution. That's what we're talking about. And, and we can reduce the probability of getting severely ill by exercising. And that's what we're here to do. Life Dweller says people are getting hit by trucks or have heart attacks are more susceptible to, uh, to viruses, uh, potentially. Um, so yeah, uh, friends, if you're enjoying this content and you're here right now, please hit that like button. That just lets me know that we should do more videos like this. If you would like that recipe ebook, you can go over to our website, myoscience.com. Use the coupon code ebook12. And uh, as always, thanks for being here on a Saturday. I'm glad that, um, I'm glad that you're here and uh, have a great rest of your weekend. We'll catch you all soon. Bye now.